Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Citrix ShareFile, secure file transfer built for business. Visit sharefile.com, click on the microphone, and enter TWIST for a free 30-day trial. And by Full Sail University, offering a variety of master's degree programs in data and technology-related fields, including an innovation and entrepreneurship master's. To learn more about Full Sail's master's degree programs, visit fullsail.edu slash twist. And by AWS Activate, the Amazon Web Services Startup Program. It's easy to start and scale your business with AWS. Visit aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis, and this is This Week in Startups. Today on the program, Charlie O'Donnell. He runs Brooklyn Bridge Ventures. He is an angel investor with an $8.3 million fund. He puts about $250,000 to work in each of the companies he works with, and he's got about 30 of them in his portfolio. And three of them... Uh, went on to do very large Kickstarter projects or Indiegogo projects. And uh, he's a pretty like awesome, serious, up-and-coming angel investor, but he only invests in New York, thus Brooklyn Bridge Ventures. It's a great 60-, 70-minute conversation, and you're going to learn a lot about raising money. And you're going to get introduced to this new generation of VCs, you know, 40-year-old angel investor and VCs who've been around for 10, 20 years working in the industry, but now are being given the checkbooks to make those critical first investments in startups. It's a great episode. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't going to live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. It's me, your host, Jason Calacanis. And this is our 480 some odd episode. We've been doing this for a long time, about five years. Now, the show has a pretty simple format. I either do the news roundtable, typically on Thursday or Friday, with two really smart people, angel investor, journalist, founder kind of thing, or I have a founder or investor on the program or some other luminary, as it were. Today will be no different. Uh, Today we have Charlie O'Donnell on the program, and he is with Brooklyn Bridge Ventures. And I've known Charlie for a decade. He's a really smart, considered guy, and he's done a lot of great angel investments. And you're like one of the new breed of micro VCs. Is that like a fair thing to say? Or do you consider yourself an angel, a micro VC? Because you have like a like me, a $10 million fund, basically. Yeah, yeah. So it's a little, a little over eight. And when entrepreneurs ask me if I do angel investments, yeah. what they're really asking me is, do you go early into small rounds? And so I say yes. Right. Even though it's not technically all my capital at work, right. it's other people and it's a fund, but that's really, you know, I do yeah. angel rounds. And this is kind of a new thing in the marketplace, isn't it? Because usually angels were like, there was a very small number of them without funds, and then there were VCs here, but there wasn't this sort of new homebrew, launch fund, mm-hmm. Brooklyn Bridge. It's like a whole little consortium now of people with 10 to... $30 million, call it. Yeah, I think there's sort of a second generation of it. I mean, yeah. I got a chance to work for the guy that I think kicked it off, is Josh Koppelman. Oh, yeah, first so round. first round was really, yeah. I think, the first sort of institutional seed player in the market. And yeah. And want to stay small and, and, and stick with those types of rounds. And they've matured. Right. Uh, they're still small and consistent, but you know, there's a whole bunch of people working there and a platform team and all that sort of stuff. And then there's a couple of newer funds uh, in New York. It's like me and uh, Lara Ventures yeah. and a few other folks. And so this is typically what? A $250,000 check? $500,000 check? How yeah, much? So do, something like that? Typical round for me is two fifty of a $1 million round on a four pre. So it's that defined? Like, uh, because I literally ran the math and that's and trying to figure yeah, out yeah. like, well, like pricing. Yeah. Where to seed pricing? What affects pricing? And uh, that's been my sort of average. Round. So you wind up owning five percent of a company, basically. Uh, you, but you're investing before there's a product or after there's a product. Typically, it's about half and half. Half and half. And product is sometimes a loose term. They okay. duct tape something together, and yeah, you can look at it, but it's not something you'd want to show a lot of people. How do you make that decision? Because that's something I'm struggling with right now as an investor. Mm-hmm. I've done seventy five investments and. A lot of times it's just somebody who I know. So I'm like, well, okay, Travis, like we know each other and you're doing Uber, so I'll give you money. Like, But other times, 
you know, I'm looking at something saying, I don't really know this person all that well, and the product's not launched. This person has the product launch, and I can actually see it functioning and people using it. That's a lot easier to make that bet. It's kind of challenging, isn't it, to make the previous sure. bet? Sure. I think the best example I have of that in my portfolio is a company called Tiny Bop. Tiny Bop. Bop, yeah. yeah. So they make kids' apps for iOS. Tiny B-O-P. B-O-P, Got yeah. It. And I backed that company when it was Raul, who's the founder, uh-huh. and an idea. And oh, he was... does the human body. I know yeah. this app. Yeah. It's, this is a great app. It's, we have this app in our house. This It's a really fantastic app. They did a follow-up to it called Plants. I it's have it on well. the screen right here. There yeah. you go. Look at that. Beautiful. Um, and they're going to come out with a series of apps that are incredibly well-illustrated, really educational. This is exactly the plan that he outlined to me. Mm-hmm. Literally... Person and an idea. No deck, no nothing. No deck, person and idea, and you give them $250,000 mm-hmm. or something to that effect. Yeah, I'm in for 300 Yeah, so how do you determine that this was a good idea so without good. having seen them demonstrate that they deserve and should be trusted with it's, money? Yeah, it would have been hard to hack up the human body on a weekend. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was an un- unbuildable weekend project. Right. You know, So it You're took talking. them six months or whatever to, to put all that together. I met Raul about two years before ah. at the Brooklyn Beta Conference, hmm. which if you even knew what that was, hmm. you're in sort of a rarefied air of creatives, front-end developers. It's like it's like knowing that somebody went to the lobby. Right. Like if you knew what it was, you're kind of in. Yeah, right. Only so certain... you connected some dots in the Mark Suster kind of way, like this person's been around. Yeah. Um, and... So there's so there's knowing that he has the capability to even know what good quality illustration yeah. and design is, knowing the network hmm. that he came from, and also knowing that he's a forty something year old dad of two kids and just even the way he takes pictures of his kids on Instagram. Huh. He's really into observing their creativity and inspiring it and all that sort of stuff. So that's interesting. The nature of the individual founder. Like how they carry themselves, what mm-hmm. their, yeah, the detail in which they, you know, even take their Instagram photos could give you a little bit of a clue of who they are. Absolutely. Um, so how many uh, founders do you have to meet with to find a tiny bop where it feels right to write the check? So uh, I estimated that I will see, and that could mean a demo day with 20 yeah. things or just an email or whatever, mm-hmm. about 1,800 things a year. 1800 a year. Yeah. That's like looking at something. Now, how many meetings do you wind up doing? About, actually, I take a week or whatever. Way less meetings than most of these investors. Huh. Um, probably between 150 and 175 a year. Okay. So a couple of weeks, four a week, or something to that effect. Versus like four a day. Right. Which I think a lot of people are taking. Four a day? Yeah, I do two a day probably. Maybe, you no, know, maybe I, yeah. Because you don't need and to you're be not a person. A full time fund. No. I do three. Investments, two or three investments a month, which I, from what I understand, is an extraordinary amount. But um, everybody's got their own strategy. Everybody's got their own strategy yeah. here. Yeah. What, it, it, speaking of strategy, what has to happen for you to get your next fund, right? Because you're a first time fund mm-hmm. uh, runner, manager, and you've got 8.3 million. You've invested half of it or um, a third of a it? A little over half. Yeah. And I got a couple of names. I have about. It's like two-thirds spoken for. I got another year of investing out of this fund. What has to happen for you to be able to go to the next level and say, and I'm assuming the next level is a $20 million fund or something, Mm -hmm. what do you have to prove? My hope is that I proved it. Oh, okay, good. So far, there's 19 companies in the portfolio. We've got six next rounds of step-ups and only... So that next round and step-up, that's a major proof point? Yeah, think for it's you know it'd be hard to expect exits after two years. No, I mean that's just not really reasonable if you're building larger companies. Yeah, sometimes things get flipped, but you're not going to have yeah. a two three hundred million dollar exit after a year and a half. No, but that is a, a really good early sign. So of the nineteen, sixteen have had no a, six. Oh, six. Six. Yeah. six of the 19 have actually gone. 16, the, I would have raised Because I would have been like, wow, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> what a battery average. Yeah. But yeah. six out of 19 have had a round after that. Yeah. So and the portfolio is sitting at a little under 2x right now. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So what needs to happen, do you think? So 2x, you think, 
it's reasonable for somebody to come along and say, you know what, I gave you a hundred thousand in the first fund, I'll give you another hundred or two or three hundred the next time. Yeah, I would imagine that, and I've had conversations with my existing guys, yeah. and they are thrilled for the most part. I mean, right. they're you know, it's a great group. Yeah, who are your LPs and how so, did you pick them? Uh, oh, you know what? Let's do a commercial break yeah, sure. and then I'll get that because that's a good okay. teaser. Uh, and let me just uh, take a moment here and say thank you to our friends at Citrix ShareFile. Because in business, we are constantly collaborating with coworkers and clients, sharing files like contracts, spreadsheets, presentations, photos, uh, all this document library stuff that we do. And it's essential that these important files are kept safe, secure, and under your control. That's why I recommend Citrix ShareFile. We use it here and we use it when we're closing deals and want to know, hey, who's accessing these files from? what IP address and who has what rights, you know, very granular rights you can set up in terms of permissions. This person can edit it, this person can move it, this person can replace it, you get the idea. And you can use it from any of your devices, of course, you'd expect that, and you can, laptop, tablet, smartphone. And it syncs automatically like uh, it should, and everything is up to date. Access, edit, share, request files on the go, uh, and that's a really cool file. You, somebody doesn't have to even be a user of ShareFile. You can just request a file, send them to a URL, they give it to you, and you get an email alert that it's uh, in your box waiting for you. So if you want to try ShareFile, go ahead and go to ShareFile.com, click on the microphone button, uh, and then uh, enter the promo code TWIST and get a 30-day free trial. That's right. Go to ShareFile.com, click on the radio microphone button and use the promo code TWIST. That stands for This Week in Startups. And uh, go ahead and visit sharefile.com and type in TWIST. Thank you at Citrix at Sharefile. Go ahead and if you're a super fan of the show, say thank you to at Sharefile on your Twitter handle. All right. So uh, when we left our hero, Charlie O'Donnell, he uh, <laughs> had just doubled uh, his returns on the fund and uh, a lot of work left to do, obviously, sure. to realize all that stuff. Mostly um, on their part. Exactly. Oh, yeah, that's one of the, isn't that one of the great <laughs> things about being an investor is like you don't actually have to sweat through all the problems that founders have to do every day. It's such an easier life. I mean, oh, these yeah. VCs are like – they always like to put up this front, I find, the VCs, that they have this like incredibly challenging and hard life. In all honesty, it's not hard, is it? Not nearly compared to – what the entrepreneurs are doing. So what percentage difficult is our job as investors to the job of an entrepreneur running the companies we invest in? You know, it's interesting. Somebody, I, I came from a pitch event yeah. and I was talking to one of my founders and they said, uh, oh man, you must get really tired of that. Yeah. And I was like, no, that's that's actually what I do. And he's like, oh, I wouldn't be able to do that. Right. And I was like, well, great. I wouldn't be able to do your job either. Right. And so he found the idea of, of sitting through the pitches. Stuff, yeah, to be painful. Right. And I found his idea of what he does all day to be painful. What percentage painful. is it in terms of – I have my own percentage. I just wrote it down on a piece of paper. But I'm curious I, what you think it is in terms of you have to be Travis running Uber or Marco running Thumbtack or whoever, Evan running Twitter back in the day, like Dennis running Foursquare. I mean that's that company has just been just hard work and everybody's mm -hmm. counting him out. Every two seconds he keeps you know being resilient. I, I How hard depends. is his life versus ours? I love my life. Yeah. So it's easy. I work hard. Yeah. I have a different set of problems than they do. Yeah. And so, I think it's one percent as easy. Yeah, I think maximum it really, ten. It really depends on what's what's like, the worst day for an angel or a visa. Oh yeah. Like, like it's what's not our like, worst day? You don't you don't come out at the end of the day and say, "Oh man, I just met way too many interesting people today." Like yeah. That, oh my god, it's like yeah. I was on three board calls. Oh, the yeah. humanity! Yeah. No, like no. I can tell you, my worst day as an entrepreneur, laying off seventy people. No, that sucks. Having somebody cry while I'm laying them mm -hmm. off in front of ten people, and I say, "Why are you crying? You know, you're going to be fine." But and they say, "Because I love working for you and this company so much." But if you were a VC, like, that's and a you terrible, were, terrible day. If you were a VC and you had bad returns. And you couldn't raise your next fund. Yeah, it takes ten years to figure that out, though. And you, yeah, no, it takes a long time, right? <laughs> but when you're done as a VC, yeah, you're, you're done. done. Yeah, that you is true. You don't start another fund. You're never raising again. You literally have to find another career. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, if you fail, as long as you, you know, try hard, treated people right, it was a good idea. You may yeah. put in your effort. Like you can try again. You can't try again as a VC. I kind of love. That's that's a fair point, but it's so much easier. What's your worst – What has that been like a bad day? What's the worst day you could ever have? I'm trying to think. Like, I, I would say the worst day I've had in my career I had as an entrepreneur. And yeah. it was the day I knew my company wasn't going anywhere. What day was that? You know, I – And which company was that? So I had started a company called Path 101. 
It was oh, helping I remember people. this. Yeah, it was – we were crawling the web for resumes to try and figure out what the hell everybody actually did for a living huh. and how they got there. Right. And so it was like money ball for careers basically. Gotcha. It's a reasonable idea. Yeah. And, and uh, I was a terrible product manager. Didn't really understand what the process of product management was. Right. Didn't have Envision. You know, didn't have any of that sort of stuff. Right. And uh, Envision isn't sponsoring this episode, but by the way, that's a fantastic product. <laughs> so um, I'll give my audible selection later. <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, um, and and also we were fundraising yeah. in the fall of two thousand eight. I was literally in the valley the day that Lehman went under. Wow, that must have been so great. It You're was going to meet with VCs, and they're like. Uh, by the way, um, I, I got to get out of here in just a minute because I have to like unload my portfolio before the yeah. Dow loses another 5%. And my LPs are in the process of committing suicide. So um, can we just speed this along, Path 101? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's literally how it went. Somebody was like, oh, are you watching the market? And I yeah. was like, actually, I don't have any money. So yeah. no, I'm not no, actually I don't watching have any the market. Stock, so yeah. I don't really I care. Really thing to start. It must be really depressing yeah. for the rest of you. Yeah, no, it sucked. It sucked. What do you um, think? Why do you think you sucked as a product manager? I mean, what was I, it? Like, I you just didn't. You didn't have a feel for product, or you didn't. I didn't know respect the, the craft. Ah, explain that. So I think a lot of business founders, non-technical founders, mm. they think, oh well, I'll just go hire somebody to code, mm-hmm. and I have the idea. I found the money. This person's coding, and they think that's the whole Shebang. thing. Yeah, and the process of like. What is actually the idea? Mm. And how do you best execute that idea? Which feature should it have? Which feature should it not have? Whatever. Testing with users, figuring out the design, all that sort of stuff is key before it gets to your development team. Right. Right. Because it's the, what you don't appreciate is that development, full stack development, is a whole thing in and of itself. Right. Your CTO is not the person who's going to decide that this should be a scroll menu versus some other kind of thing. Right. They're figuring out how to get it to load fast on every platform. They have a whole other thing to do. Yeah. Which is a business founder you don't really appreciate. They have to write the actual code. They have to write the actual code. Right. And all not make product stuff. decisions. So it's funny. I mean, we joke about, you know, remember the movie, what is it, uh, Office Space? Right. Where the guy's job is to take the requests from the customers right. and give it to the engineer. Right. And we joke that right. that's a job. Right. But that is basically product management. That is And it's an important job. How do you get the yeah. how do you get what the client wants and interpret it in a way that you can actually build something reasonable and And, all and that I sort think of stuff. one of the things people underestimate also is, especially young founders, they think, well, I'll just tell the developers what to build. And it's like, well, the developer needs a little bit more to go yeah. on than what you remember. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you want to do And by the way, as a founder, you're probably going to change it like seven times. So getting it down on paper and actually doing that, the Envision mock-ups or whatever it is, and doing the workflows in the UX, it's hard stuff. But it's become a science now, hasn't it? Yes. And there's so much more information out there about it. There's yeah. so many user experience researchers and stuff blogging and in 2007, no one was really talking about user research. It, it, startups were... It was almost like all secrets. Like, how do you negotiate a term sheet? What is a term sheet? What is UX? What, you know, all this stuff, what didn't even, it wasn't documented. Now it's all fully documented. You could find 20 different people's opinion on how to best do wireframes. It's the same way VC used to be. Right. When I was at Union Square, right. when uh, Fred was blogging and I was blogging, we had literally both started a couple months before. Yeah. Uh, we actually had uh, some of our investors ask us why we were spending so much time blogging. Right. Shouldn't we be out looking for deals right. instead of blogging? I mean, could you imagine Union Square Ventures without the blog? blog? Yeah, yeah, no. It, I mean, it is Union Square Ventures. And so... Uh, I mean, the comments on Fred's blog are Union Square it's Ventures. It's a whole community. It's a whole it. community of people. Like, if you're in New York and you're an entrepreneur, you've read Fred's blog, and the first thing you want to do when you raise funds is go see Fred. Sure. Right. You want to go raise money. It's like, well, I got to talk to Fred. I got to get a meeting with Fred. Right? It's the first thing you have to do. It, uh, well, hopefully now it's Fred, Charlie, all, all, everybody else. Everybody but. else. But, <laughs> I mean, that is one of the things of the cult of personality that has happened, I think. You look at Mark and Teresa, oh, yeah. what he's done in the last, what do you think of all his, like, tweet storms and this nonstop Twitter barrage? I, I like the fact that he seems not to take himself too seriously. No, he's a funny dude. 
he a couple of times I've picked on him a little. Yeah. I've said that I was gonna, you know, do the whole uh dressing up as as Mark for Halloween. Yeah. You know, I already have the whole yeah. bald thing yeah. going and he'll favorite it, he'll retweet yeah. it. He's he's cool about it. He is liberal with the faves. Yeah. I think that that's his thing. It's like, I'm just going to fist bump everybody, and that's just going to create this uh, massive He's like the strength. Gary V of the big VC world. He basically, it's like he's the Gary V of the of the world. I'm just going to touch everybody. <laughs> um, and it's interesting. I, you know, I'm, I've been trying to figure out if he's got a ghostwriter or how this is like much content is being it's made. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of time because he's doing 50 tweets a day. Like, this is literally two thirds of his time, and there's a lot of people that work at Andreessen. So who's managing everybody? What's, the, like, what's going <laughs> on with the portfolio? And, I, and you know what? I've come to the conclusion that I think he's going to do this for one full year and then stop. So I think it's like oh, a the same one, way when he first started blogging. The same thing he did when he blogged. He's going to do it for one year. He's going to drop the microphone and be like, you know what? I did it. I took over Twitter for a year. Y'all followed me, and now I'm just going to go back to work as a VC. <laughs> but it's a one-year sure, Twitter uh, sort of thing. So how do you pass on stuff? Let me ask you your process for saying no, because you have to say no mm-hmm. to, I don't know, 100 Most, things a week. So A lot of stuff. Do you say no to everything that's sent to you or only 100? I try. You try to on email. Yeah. I, and in fact, I, I do, and I always tell people, if you send me something – and I don't get back to you within like a week, just forward it to me again. Yeah. Like I get a lot of email. Yeah, email is impossible to keep up it's with. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. But to me, uh, I need to turn you down because otherwise you're going to be in my inbox for the next month. Got it. And so I need to tell you no. Yeah. And why. Right. And that. How I'm, much detail do you get into, I wonder? Uh, I, I do you say like this is just terrible design or do you like, how well, matter if, of fact are you? I'm pretty matter of fact. Yeah. And the best emails that I've gotten are when somebody uh, comes back to me and says, hey, I pitched you back in January. You totally hated it. We're going to prove you wrong. You're stupid. Right. But the feedback was really awesome, and you should meet my friend who's also doing a startup. Oh, that's good. I was like, wow, I turned that guy down. But he still wants you to meet the next person. Because he found the feedback valuable. All right. Let's go through some of your other portfolio companies. I, I know I have one pulled up here. Um, I'm going to hit the play button here. And you can just talk over it a little bit. Oh, Canary. Bit. So this is Canary. What mm-hmm. is this? So this is the world's most easy to set up home security. Got it. So it looks like HAL or something like that. What is it? So it's a small device that sits in the corner of your sort of main area. Yep. And pays attention to what's normal in your space. So as opposed to installing something in Mm. every window, on every door, this perimeter that half the time you forget the alarm's on, you open the back door, the wind swings it open. This is cloud-connected computer vision, knows the difference between you and your dog kind of thing. Got it. And uh, will keep you up to date on what's going on in spaces you care about. And this was a Kickstarter, wasn't it? This was on Indiegogo. Indiegogo. Which uh, at the time they set the record on Indiegogo. Really, they did almost two million dollars in pre-sales. Wow! So when did you invest? When the before ki- the pre-sale? Oh, really? Yeah. So you met them before they started Kickstarter? Yes. And so, well, you invested before they did Kickstarter. What's your advice to entrepreneurs who are going to do that? Like, do you suggest they do the Kickstarter then raise money, or should they raise money and then do Kickstarter? So um, pre-sales have become a channel. Right, a, a channel and actually a funding strategy. Right, because they went for they ramped up in terms of their team, partly because they were able to because of the sell pre-sale so many, yeah. and the pre- they were able to sell so many and it brought in funds and they were able to really build out their team, which improved their chances of coming to market with a product and yeah and, and so. Well, you don't do you remember what they did on Indiegogo? Uh, one point nine six million. And that's pretty amazing. Uh, it, what was really funny is the first day I woke up early. It was I was up at like 5 in the morning and no one had bought anything yet because the press hadn't come out. Right. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, my God, this is going to be such a dog. No one's buying this. Hmm. I emailed like all of my friends. I think I bought two. <laughs> they literally blew through 100 grand in the first day. Wow. 
All right. Hey, when we get back from commercial break, let's go through the rest of the portfolio. And let me just say uh, thank you to Full Sail University. Um, they have an online innovation entrepreneurship master's degree program. That's an intensive 12-month program, and you're going to learn the process for developing a tech-based product or service. You could have used this, Charlie, sure. with Path 101. You would have learned how to make prop product. Prop, yeah, that would help. Prod- properly made product. Courses include ideation, product design, and development, and financial strategies. Hey, like Kickstarter's a strategy. All taught by industry experienced instructors and graduates. Uh, And you're going to graduate with a fully formed business strategy and the tools to pitch potential investors like me and Charlie. Other full sale master's degree programs include internet marketing, business intelligence, and public relations. And our director, our director Jacob went there. Uh, you can learn more about Full Sail Master's Degree Program in Innovation and Entrepreneurship or any of their related programs at fullsail.edu slash twist, fullsail.edu slash twist. And they've been a great partner. Like I said, Jacob went there. He had an amazing experience, and it's part of why he came to work here. Um, we, uh, we we thought, hey, wow, he went to this Full Sail University, and he learned a lot. And it sure has paid off because he can do a lot of different things here for the show, and the show has been leveling up since he got here. So everybody say thank you at Full Sail on Twitter as well because, you know, the sponsors love when they see you thanking them and giving them love on the Twitter. All right. Um, my guest today, Charlie O'Donnell, uh, VC with Brooklyn Bridge Ventures. Uh, so Canary did amazing. But you know They're what I found? I've been, I've been investing in some hardware and, like, the Kickstarter things. People hit their goal on Kickstarter. They don't have enough money to, to really ship. To really build a serious manufacturing process. And to ship. Like literally one hundred or two hundred and fifty or five hundred thousand dollars. I've seen these enough. Kickstarters. It's not enough. So I literally had a pitch today from somebody who was like, Hey, we want you to invest. I was like, But didn't you hit your you blew through your goal? You did three hundred thousand dollars. They're like, Yeah, absolutely. I'm like, well, why do you need money? They're like, Well, that'll cover building the units and delivering them. I was like, Okay. They're like, but it won't cover the salaries of everybody who does it. I was like, whoa, why did you take everybody's money? So basically you're telling me if you don't raise another million dollars, you can't ship your product? This is happening all over Indiegogo and Kickstarter. There is a massive, massive risk right now, I believe, in these Kickstarter projects because they're coming to VCs and angels to try to, after they've raised and taken two fifty dollars and $500,000, to try to actually get the actual funds needed. They would need to charge... Not $199 for these products. They would need to charge like $599. If they're planning on funding salaries with that, yeah. Yeah. The, all three companies that I have backed that have done pre-sales uh-huh. have been funded before the pre-sale. Really? So Canary, yeah. Ringley, and Gotenna. What is Ringley? I know that one. So Ringley is a connected uh, consumer electronics device targeted towards women. Oh, it's yes. A, a this is the jewelry. Communi- communications platform embedded in jewelry. Right. And it's the most successful pre-sale of any consumer electronics product targeted towards women. Okay. There's a, okay, so that's how you're uh, defining it. Okay, so towards women. What did it raise? Uh, I wonder. I don't know if she said the number out. It's oh, because like, you did it on the site? On the site. Oh, so did you use Tilt or something? Uh, they I, think they, or? I think they homegrew it, actually. They, ro- they rolled their own. And one of the reasons why is because it's uh, a fashion brand. Got that it. That they felt like. Kickstarter, Indiegogo wasn't exactly the place where stylish female consumers would go shop for something they were going to wear every day. Yeah. It's very cool. I'm looking at it right now. So basically, it will vibrate when you're getting a call. It keeps you from using your phone as a fashion accessory. You put the Ah, phone away. Yes. So it will – I don't need to keep – yeah. Because women, unlike men – Women put their phones in their purse. We don't get to have purses, although I have a purse. <laughs> I have a couple of purses, actually. They don't always have a convenient pocket. I call them a satchel because Indiana European. Jones had one. It's more European. I feel more sophisticated, but it's a purse, let's be honest. Uh, but this actually makes sense because if this, I can't tell you how many times I'm trying to get in touch with my wife. I'm like, she's like, how is it my purse? On, on her. It's in my purse, right. So this is a great idea. So it's just a little light goes on. Or it vibrates. Or it vibrates and you're done. And you can set it up not just to be about texts, but it syncs up with a whole bunch of apps. So, oh. for example, you can know when your Uber is arriving. Got it. So you get like a certain vibration when it's Uber. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah. Instagram right. likes, the whole thing. Genius. That's a really good one. What's the one you sent me that is the uh, Wi-Fi one? Social sign-in. That's a really good one. I'm still kind of like... I've been thinking about that one uh, a lot. So they... Because I see... Uh, what do you call it? Um... GoGo, 
Oh, not Gogo. Yeah. Um, Boingo. Boingo is now starting to go like in the ad v- version, but this is different. Explain social sign-in. So social sign-in. I think this could be a big one. Helps you market to existing customers in a venue. Right. So you're sitting at Pete's Coffee. Right. And you come in every day. They have no idea who the hell you are. But they're giving you Wi-Fi and coffee. They're giving you Wi-Fi and coffee. Okay, so how so do they solve the So they're connecting to you digitally, except they're not really connecting to you because mm-hmm. they don't know who you are. Right. So you're just, you know, hitting I accept the terms of service and all that sort of stuff. What social sign-in does is they present a front end that is manageable by the venue. Mm-hmm. And you exchange the Wi-Fi for any number of social actions. It could be give me an email address. It could be sign in via Facebook. It could be download our app. Ah, so I get you to do something, just like Boingo does. Like Boingo now is doing like, you know, at airports, pay us or download an app or watch a video. Mm -hmm. But this is for the venue to say, because I think it's at the Ace Hotel, right? Uh, yeah, it's at... Uh, I saw it at some hotel. That's how I ran yeah, into it. Yeah, it's at some hotel. It's in a lot of places now. I mean, they've yeah. got a lot of customers right now. And I was, I thought it was pretty slick because I was like, I've never been to this hotel's thing. I bought my thing on Hotel Tonight. Like I, but yeah, I was you like, had no oh, relationship with the hotel. I don't have a relationship with the hotel, but I was like, yeah, of course I'll authenticate with Facebook if that gives me free Wi-Fi. It's not, you know, whatever. Yeah, you're not, not going to go gonna without... You, you're not going to post to my wall... You know, exactly. using the Wi-Fi. So it's not like they force you to do something nefarious, right? Basically, no one stops at that point. If you right. need Wi-Fi, you need Wi-Fi. Exactly. And getting people to, to uh, download an app in exchange for Wi-Fi, like, I'll, yeah, I'll download the Ace Hotel or Starbucks's app to get Wi-Fi too. So that seems like a really great thing. So here's an example of yeah. uh, where it's being used. Madison Square Park in New York. Yeah. So there's a park conservancy that raises money for the park. Got it. So there's... Hundreds, if not thousands, of people use the park every day. Thousands, and they are Shake Shack's there. Shake Shack's there, exactly. Right. Thousands. So they are getting people to sign in for the Wi-Fi and collecting hundreds of email addresses a week. Which means they can hit those people up for donations. Yeah, or let them know. And those when are people that like the park. They're in the park. They like they're the in the park. park. They yeah. like the park, right? Such if they're in the venue, idea. those are your best customers. Such a great idea. So you put – are you the only investor in this or who did the round? So it's uh, – the first, the seed round is me and mostly angel investors. Got it. And then after they were – so it started out literally like Mike and a hacked router. Right. There was hardly anything there. Right. And we got some customers. We grew traction. Uh, then after he started to get that initial traction, he went into Techstars. Got it. So he was actually relatively mature for yeah. a company going into Techstars. And did they come to you and ask like, hey, we're going to give Techstars 6% of our company for 100 k It's like a $2 million valuation. You might have paid a $4 million valuation. How did you look at that? So, Or did you negotiate the valuation? So I think there was a little sort of give and take around they exactly what the deal. Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, it started out as a conversation around an investment from Bullet Time. Oh. So David Cohen has a fund. Right. And then it was like, well, why don't you go into Techstars? And at first we were like, no, nah, we're not, you know, we're not. Uh, we're further along. We're further along, right? Yeah, and, you're not, nothing, no offense to people in Techstars, but we've been doing this for a year and we have customers. Yeah, exactly. So what, that was the in? initial inclination. Right. Mike went and. And met with them, met with Alex, who runs the New York Tech Stars, and walked out and said, those guys are really motivated to help mm. us out. Um, actually, this could be really good for us. Hmm. Because what had happened was, you know, we, we pitched to that seed round to everyone yeah. in New York and really struggled to put it together, cobbled it together. Hmm. Then they made a lot of progress. And then we realized, oh, wait, if we then go into Tech Stars and then go to Demo Day, everyone's going to see us again having made a lot of progress since the last time, and right. that's going to be a great way to show momentum. So one thing a lot of startups don't realize is just because someone says no the first time around, right. if you actually go out and and hustle and, and, and execute. I just got out of a meeting with a female founder who, like, she had, like, a very, like, what I considered, like, a small little business. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she said, I'll, I'll be back. And I said, great. Pick me in a time. She's like, I'm ready to talk to you again. I just came up right before this taping, and... She's, She's made, made progress. tremendous progress. Yeah. And I said, you know what? It's so close to me wanting to invest. If you could get a contract with three or four of these people using the platform that's set X, 
or and why. You're going to be in because she's going to go get it. And so, you know, if you think that you can do that, and she's like, I'll be back in two weeks. I was like, okay, my type of entrepreneur. Guaranteed you're going to wind up being And I'm like, you know, whatever. I mean, if you can, it, it really is, I think at its, in today's market, there's so much noise. Like you have so many people trying to get to you. That if a person builds credibility over time, yeah. it's such a differentiator, isn't it? And I think one thing that a lot of founders miss is that that process never stops. Oh. Just because you spent a long time trying to raise your seed round and saying, hey, Jason, let me tell you what we're doing now. Let me yeah. do all sorts of stuff. What sometimes happens is, okay, great. You raise your seed round. They go in a hole. Yeah. They build product. They hire some people. No one's heard of them for a while. Yeah. Then you go to the Series A guys who you've never built a relationship with. Right. They didn't hear about you. You should have went to them the day after you closed your seed round right. and said, I don't need money from you. I just want to anchor you where I am now right. and figure out where the bar needs to be, figure out where we need to go. Right. Because you're, that's when people say you're, you're always fundraising. You're not always pitching, but you're always making an impression right. and showing, hey, by the way, we're twice as good as we were last month. How do you look at valuations? Because you said before, like, it's typically four, pre, five. Mm -hmm. But things have started to get away from themselves where you must have people like I do coming to you without their product launch asking for six, seven, eight. And if they're getting eight and the other people got four, you could do two investments for the same price. Yeah, you're spending too much time in the Valley. It's it is a like Valley that. thing. It's, it's not a like really, I think the, the Valley scene is very different. Yeah. It's, it's also not exactly the same companies. Right. Right. Chances are a Valley founder has pedigree. Right. Now, whether that translates into being who knows? the best company, who knows, right? right. But you're not going to see a three-time founder in New York. Right. And so you're not paying You'll see for a two-time founder like yeah, maybe yeah, Kevin you're Ryan starting, yeah, or yeah, yeah, exactly. you know, Dennis Crowley. There's a couple mm -hmm. of those. But even – It's a know, small number. Kickstarter is a first-time founder, I so think. Out of, Etsy's a first-time founder. Out of the 19 deals in my portfolio yeah. right now – only Mike from Social Sign In has run a venture back company before. Huh. So, so mostly you first really time. are giving people their first chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in that exchange, you know, you're saying, look, I'm I'm taking a risk here. Right. And if you want me actively engaged, whatever, this has to be meaningful for me right. too. And the other thing is I mean, I have, a quarter million dollars for five percent seems more than reasonable. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean that's a if lot we sell of this, money. If, if we sell this for $100 million, you make no, a 25x. No one's going to yeah. complain that they diluted too much in the seed round. No. Yeah, if you can go 10x to 20x, you need to actually go because you're going to wind up having 40 investments. You need to have one of those investments beat 40x to be even, and you need an 80x if you were going to double, let's say if everything was sideways. So, the way I, so I need a little over $900 million of enterprise value in the funds to be a 3x fund. So that's the way the math. That's works. a lot of work. But 30 companies though. Right. So you need so the average venture backed M&A transaction is about 200 million. Right. So you need three average exits. Yeah. And about five so-so yeah. 50s. Right. And then you're almost there. Right. But that only works on an 8 to 10 million dollar fund. Right. You start raising 100 200 million dollars. Huh. Now, you know, the example that Josh from First Round always likes to use is if you have a $500 million fund hmm. and you maintain 20% ownership as a VC hmm. in $2 billion companies, yeah. you haven't even returned the fund. Right. That's a very high bar. That's a scary bar. It is a huge, scary bar. You have to be buying. I think when the, when the people raise that kind of funds, they're buying $50 million worth of Twitter or, you know, House or whatever, Uber at a late stage. And they Trying look stupid. One and a half, two hours. Yeah, X. they look stupid for like, like Shervin looked so stupid for all of six months when he invested at $300 million and, you know, beat Mark Andreessen's $220 million offer for Uber. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, well, Mark looks really dumb for, you know, turning down Travis for an $80 million difference in a company that's worth $20 billion. Remember how many people said that David Z was crazy for doing, what was it, Facebook at yeah. 
Was it a billion or 500 or something, something like, like that? that or something yeah. in that? Yeah. I mean, listen, Microsoft was insane doing it at 13 billion or whatever it was. They bought their couple of points. They bought like 5% or something at 13 billion and now it's a $200 billion company. That worked out. That's a hell of a return, isn't it? So in your estimation, um, what is it that makes a great entrepreneur today in, in 2014 going into 2015? Because it's a very crowded market. Getting attention for your product is so hard now. Back when we started in this game, well, I started 20 years ago, but you started at least 10. <laughs> so even in 2007, I mean, you know, everybody knew what Path 101 was. I remember it. Like, you were one product of three that launched that month or three that launched sure. that week. Now we've got product on got 40 things per day. Yeah, yeah. So It's a lot more crowded. What does it take today, do you think? So I don't – I think it's a practice. Mm -hmm. You – an, an, an entrepreneur is being a great entrepreneur versus they just are, right? right? When somebody, I, I think when you say, oh, that's a great team, mm. it's such a, you know, Monday morning quarterback kind yeah. of thing. I mean, I, I know deals, and, and I'll take the Canary team as an example. Yeah. I'm on the board. I watch how great they are at running their company mm. and how great they are at, Hiring. I've gotten to know a lot of people on the team, mm. and it's it's really amazing to see first time founders as good as they are. I take zero credit for picking them out as great founders. Mm. There's nothing on their resume that it, they yeah. never run a venture back company before. They seemed like reasonable guys that I thought I could work with with a really great idea in a big open market. Hmm. That's about as much as I will, that's yeah. all I could say I knew. Right. And they, it, it comes from being serious, it comes from being disciplined. I, I think it's a discipline, it's a practice. Right. You know, so you are a great founder because you do the things that great founders do. Right. You actually but run Interesting, a... it's, it's, I think it's part of your martial arts training. Is oh like, yeah. It comes out and that we both practice sure. Taekwondo, we practice Taekwondo together before. Mm -hmm. um, it is very, much, you know, a person who practices martial arts or is a great at martial arts is somebody who practices, practices. Martial, martial arts. Yeah. And there's many people who, you know, they're uh, whatever, black belt or whatever, they don't actually practice. They stand at the side of the room and, you know, like entrepreneurship is actually doing it. It's a practice. Like it is doing totally it every practice. day and coming into work and dealing with problems and dealing with hiring. I mean, if you think about hiring, like every company I've ever been involved with, like, that's got to be our number one issue is like, oh, yeah. How do we get this position filled? It's like literally never ends. And one thing that I think a lot of founders forget is like just because you raise your seed round and you say, great, I'm going to hire, you know, a salesperson and four developers. They think they're done hmm. with recruiting. So then they, they turn that off. Right. And then they have to rebuild the whole thing when they right. get the Series A, right? right? Recruiting is a machine. Right. You know, you, you build in a recruiting function in your company. Right. It should always be going, whether or not you have an opening or not, because you never know when someone's going to mm. get poached or leave yeah. or not work out. Uh, I think people underestimate what a practice it is. Even identifying founders. Somebody says, well, yeah. how do you know a good founder? Well, I've always really been curious about people. I ask right. a lot of questions. Right. You know, I go to What's your favorite question to ask? I have my own questions, but yeah. Somebody actually gave me a really good question um, and said you should ask people what their parents do for a living. Yeah, and how I do that, that all the time. That was the question to, I was about to say, yeah. You know, how that relates to what they do. Yeah. And uh, it, it doesn't matter who they are. Right. But it definitely comes out. And you're trying to figure out – because what you're really trying to figure out is, is this founder – do they have the right set of skills for this particular problem? Hmm. And so if you get a sense of who they are, it doesn't mean they're, like, great for everything. Right. Are they great for this particular thing? Like, what motivates them to be yeah, great we, at this you particular know, thing? I, we call that um, product founder match as sure. opposed to product market fit. Sure. It's founder product fit. Like, Absolutely. does this founder love news Yes, they should do inside.com. Like people are, somebody asked me there, like, why are you doing inside.com? I'm like, I'm just born to do news. Like I just can't get enough. I can't stop. I just always feel like there's a problem to solve there. I don't know why. And you've kind of always done it. And I've always done it. Since I'm doing like a news, you know, magazine or whatever. I've always just had my hand in media. I just can't get enough. And it's stupid because you know what? It's the, one of the hardest spaces with the smallest exits. It's just 
fucking hard. But I just keep coming back to so Dennis with Foursquare. He's, he's always been doing Foursquare. He's always been Even doing location. Four square, yeah. yeah, dodgeball, whatever it is. He's just always been obsessed with that. Um, but I think that's a great question. I, yeah, I, I, I've been very um, much been asking people, like, why are you doing this idea? Like, why this idea? Like, what is it about this idea that makes you, you know, really want to do it? And you're not going to believe it, but I've had people say, like, well, this is just a ton of money in this space. And I'm just like, that's wow, not, that's not no. going to last because the second you're getting punched in the face over and over again trying to solve this problem, you're going to be like, this isn't worth the this money. This isn't worth the money. This isn't this worth is the money. Great way. Statistically, this is not a great way to make money. It's a, actually being an entrepreneur is a stupid way to try to make money unless you're willing to do it five times or six times. You literally have to commit to doing five. I think you have to commit to doing five companies to have a good outcome as, as an entrepreneur. Obviously, as an investor, we just have to commit to doing you know, a full fund sure. and deploying it properly. Um, what else do you like to ask? Um, I, one of the big things for me is actually um, how they want to work with an investor. Huh. And I always ask, what do you want from me besides money? Right. Because right. you can get money from anywhere. Yeah, there's a lot of money around. It's like, I feel like I'm selling ice to the Eskimos in New York, right? right. It, it's like, it's New York, there's a lot of money. There was yeah. never a shortage of money in New York. And if you can't never find the, the money in New York, you can't find money. Yeah. If you can't find the money in Silicon Valley or New York, it's everywhere. Throw a rock on Wall Street. You hit five private equity dudes sure. who just are splashing it around in the Hamptons every weekend. And and the, the, the key for me is – so I remember this one founder said to me, I really want investors who see the vision. Hmm. And I was like, so you want people to just yes you? Hmm. Like, you want support for right. your ideas. Right. That's actually not going to help you build a company. Right. You want somebody questioning you and, and, and not telling you what to do, but saying, yeah. how, how did you think, how did you get there on that? Right. Are you, like, auditing their, their thinking. Right. Yeah, right. here's a sounding board for you. Right. No, we all blindly buy into your vision and we'll follow it off a cliff. Yeah, that's we'll not all helpful. perish. That's not this might not be the best idea. We might want to think about what direction the boat's going and check our compasses once in a while. Yeah, sometimes I ask questions, even if I agree with the founder, mm. just to sort of see the depth of like, how did you get there on that? Yeah. Um, the founder uh, that I'm working with now is changing the name of the company pre pre launch. Yeah. And I think it's fine. I already, they're actually changing the name of the entity. And so uh, I had to sign off yeah. on it. And I signed it. Yeah. But I still asked him, right. what was the process that he went through? Right. I just want to make sure there is a process. Right. Because I think it's good discipline. What is this Gotenna thing? Because this one's kind of interesting too. I'll, I'll, I think I can hit play on this. Let me hit play. Sure. You tell me what we're looking at here. We're a dude with a headset. So, and it's a stick. Gotenna is a piece of hardware that syncs up with your phone. There you go. And turns it into a point-to-point -point communications device. Okay. Now, I've heard of this before. This is what people would refer to as a mesh network? Or so... Like, what is the technology? Is it just so connected yes and Bluetooth no. so or there's, what? Uh, no, it's not Bluetooth. So this version, this product that Gotenna has now is much longer range. Got it. So meshing is more about... Smaller range, crowded city, mm -hmm. you know, uh, this is more about emergency response. Uh, this is about getting stuck in the wilderness. This is... Yeah. Uh, You're at Coachella and there's no signal. Yeah. Burning Man, that sort of thing. Right. But it's also about privacy. Huh. Explain because, that. Yeah. So they're, it's literally off the grid. Right. It's, I send a message directly via radio to your phone. Wow. There is no NSA government that's not going over AT&T, Verizon, or anybody yeah, else. It's pretty funny. In. I see this guy is like smoking a doobie and he's uh, sending it. <laughs> now, does it use the messaging platform native to the phone or does it have to have its own messaging app? It has an app, but has an app, they yeah. are also building an SDK and API so they can plug it. So other people can things. do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is like um, a lot of people have been talking about this. I mean, obviously, the people who go camping and have no signal and are off the grid, mm -hmm. would love to have this, right? Sure. So, but now this is one where... And they kicked off a pre-sale and... Have, how did that go? It's going really, really well. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, 159 bucks, 150 bucks. Um, for a pair, I think. Oh, is it for a pair? Yeah. Yeah, it is. You need, obviously you need more than one. 
Precisely. Now, just, but will this make like a network across all of the devices, like and share people's internet connections or something like that, or no? So you'll be able to connect to anybody who also has one. So it's right. not like the pairs are exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, there's, as you can imagine, sending radio around. There's tons of regulation. Got it. And so certain bandwidths are longer range, but you're not allowed to mesh. Mm -hmm. Certain bandwidths are shorter, mesh yeah, I friendly. See this. It's using the long range radio waves, 151 to 154 megahertz. Um, so they're in conversations about what's possible. Right. They're also thinking about what is the range of products because, you know, if you and your three friends are out camping, you don't really care about meshing. If you're in Midtown trying to support your crappy signal that you get from your carrier, well, then you really do care about mesh it, mesh it, yeah. meshing and message hopping. So you invested in this one, which is quite speculative, before they did the campaign. Before yeah. they even had anything. Really? I met Daniela at South by Southwest, and South by Southwest has a little internal social network. Got it. And people tag themselves. Huh. So I checked to see who tagged themselves Brooklyn. Hmm. And she was uh, working out of NYC Resistor, oh, which is where is. that's where it's a little hardware hacker club. That's where MakerBot came out of. Ah, very. And cool. so it's another one of those local things where, like, if you're at Resistor, you're cool, right? Because not everyone is sort of. It's not like there's a thick front door, but you kind of have to sort of be on the end. And mm. so it's people who are sort of legit. And, and uh, so I was like, oh, okay. I just said to her, I want to know the hardware hackers in Brooklyn. Huh. I didn't even know she had a company. Right. And then you know, we sat down. We started chatting. And she started telling me about her idea. And I was like, oh, oh, you have a company. I didn't even know you were an yeah, entrepreneur. Yeah. I just thought it was cool Fantastic, to, yeah. you know, uh, to talk shop. And two meetings later... I was like, I get it. This is yeah. cool. If I made 30 bets like this, something this portfolio is going to pan out, right? Like, right. I don't know that this is it, right? but this is the kind of risk I want to take. Awesome. Yeah, hey, it looks like it could really – this one looks like it could super work. So it's working so far. They got to deliver and build and do all that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's I'm sort of like – it's interesting that you have hardware in your portfolio, at least two of them. And I have now have Birdie as hardware in my portfolio, and I'm looking at some other hardware stuff. And I'm really kind of interested in this hardware space, although it's very concerning, you know, how much money this all takes. Um, and, like, for angel investors to be messing with hardware is like, wow, we really need to get a VC involved in this soon. Yeah. I, I said the, the, the flip side of that, though, is you buy – you build a product – you can sell it, you get money for it, right? You don't have to That's wait true. until it gets to 100 million users. And then and turn then, on yeah. Instagram I mean, ads. Yeah. Twitter, Uber, they all took a lot of money from VCs too. Right. right. So the idea that software is more capital efficient it's not really clear to me that that's totally the case because all the big internet companies have all raised tons of money too. What's the um, worst things entrepreneurs can do today, right? We talked about, mm -hmm. you know, what's the good things they can do. And what do you think are like the tells, like the things that just automatically disqualify people or just put them in the bucket of like not fundable or probably not fundable or, you know, just no. I, I can't speak for other investors, yeah. Yeah. but character hmm. I think is really important. Yeah. Um, I just literally like turned down. I was on the plane over here. I was like, you know, going through my email, yeah. turned somebody down. And they said, well, if you know anybody else who's smart enough to know how to make money, yeah, let me send them my way. Right. And I just wrote back. I was like, dude, it's a really small world. And yeah. it's not going to help you to take shots at the people who turn you down. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Like, I... If you're not going to make... Yeah, like if you're not smart enough... Like let wow. me introduce me to other people who are smart enough to know that this is a good deal kind of thing. Wow. Yeah, that's... And in New York, seriously, we're going to run into each other. It's like five people there. Yeah, I mean, there's only there's... like five or six VCs. <laughs> yeah, you have to... And, and so I was like, this is not going to help you fundraise. And to right. me, I was like, I don't want to back that guy anyway. Yeah. Because that kind of character right. is going to mean he's going to piss off his employees... Yeah, being polarizing churn. is like it's a very interesting thing because I have a couple. Would of you invest. know about that? 
I have a couple. Well, I've been polarizing in my career at times, although I like to think I've become a little less polarized. I, you know, I'm a lot less polarizing now because when I write stuff, I can't write stuff anymore. It's really hard for me to write stuff that I know will hurt people. And I used to just not care because I just felt like the truth was the most important thing to me and being mm -hmm. honest, being from Brooklyn. And now as I've gotten older, I don't know what it is, but I actually sometimes write something and I'm like, you know what, that's going to hurt that person. And I just don't feel like hurting that's them. That's a really interesting and timely topic. I don't know if you um... – Mark's sister and I just had a conversation about this, and and Mark. Oh, Mark's sister did. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and Mark, super honest, super straightforward. Like no, he wears really, it. He wears it on his sleeve, right? Re really good yeah. guy. Yeah, of and, course. And uh, I had made a comment about uh, one of these super large fundraisings, and uh, I didn't think it was like too negative, but I was like, you know, you raise too much money, you lose focus, and and all that sort of stuff. Which is a true fact, and but not always. But I, yeah. I I believe so, but the question is, do you need to say it? Well, did you say it about a specific company? I did. Ah, yeah. So okay, yeah. And it's a company I like. Right. Um, and Mark. But we, this was public. So what company was it? Uh, Slack. Slack. Oh yeah, they raised a hundred million dollars at a billion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know everybody involved in this, and. And I a love friend the who's been on the program. The product is awesome. So you, your thought is, wow, that's just that's way a lot too of money. That's a lot of money at this stage. Yeah, they're growing like a weed. They're growing. It's a consumer product growing. It's a business product growing like a consumer and product. Growing in revenues. In revenue, that's what I'm saying. It's like it's growing yeah. like a consumer product with revenue of an enterprise product. Which I mean, I looked at the, you know, I have my friends are all investors, so I know all about it. Yeah. But yeah, so saying that you're saying. This is too much money. It's a valid point. It's you potential. Lose focus. You know, it's, yeah. it's potential, right? Right. And so Mark reached out, and what was funny was he totally called me out on it yeah. because Mark had said something about a company I even forget what it was a couple of years ago, and I reached out to him and said, you know, sort of like if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why'd you hip check that and person for no reason? Yeah, yeah. and. Mark wrote back and said, you know, I got really good advice from somebody one time, and I was totally right. And he blogged the fact that I had given him the feedback. Right. And he totally copped to it. And I was like, oh, man, you're right. Like, I said this to you, and I just did that thing. Yeah. You know, it's actually – and as a – It's v hard to hold back. I, actually, now I realize why I don't say it. It's, a lot of it has to do with being a VC, too. Like, as an investor now, you know, it's just – I can't really be as critical as I was when I was a journalist and a pundit. Because the weight I have, you know, and the weight you have as an investor or he has as an investor, like it's a little bit more serious because people go like, well, that investor, you know, Mark Schroeder is a very successful investor or Jason Calacanis mm -hmm. investor, like he could actually like, hurt, he could do reputation damage to your person. You're not going to reputation mm -hmm. damage Slack, of course. But, you know, if I say like, I was pretty hard on secret, right? Because I just think like this is pretty loathsome, like it's really badly done. And I don't feel bad about that, but I do know that a group of investors – also, we're saying that Mark said that about that group, Secret. Like, I would never invest in that. This is terrible. It's bullying. And like, anybody who has kids mm -hmm. takes the same position with that company. It's like, obviously, the people who started this company do not have kids and understand how yeah, it's awful. How awful it is to be to be bullied to be bullied, and only some knucklehead with no kids. You know, like I don't. All right, there I go again. Like, okay, it's, it's you have to have no really common sense yeah. to build a product like this, in my mind. And so I was just brutal to them uh, on Twitter. And I don't know if I regret it or not. I'm trying to think if I regret it. I don't regret it because I do think that they need to pay attention in that case. Well, and there's a constructive way to do it probably. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't constructive at well, all. Well, and, and that's the no, thing. No, I'm not constructive at I, all. I, I'm I, bombastic. No, I was constructive. I said if you had kids, you would understand. They should talk to kids. And then number yeah. two, if you have to hire the PR person who handled – the suicides and bullying issues of Formspring to be your PR person, then you might not want to build that product. And you might want to talk to all of the investors in Formspring, Kevin Rose, I think Chris Saka, a bunch of people who are beside themselves with what happened with Formspring, Formspring which went out of business. But that could be an email to them. It could be. Yeah. That's, it's, it's, it's a hard. fair point. Maybe it's, I should pull it back a little bit. It's, it's something I, I definitely have... Yeah matured and I yeah. still have lots to go. Yeah. And and one of the people who helped me a lot actually is somebody that you know is uh, Jerry Colonna. Oh really? Was he was he, was he your coach? So I went through executive coaching which oh, I did good. about six like maybe seven sessions or whatever but yeah. but like 
it was awesome to have somebody who was a VC coach who know, you. Who knows? You don't have to explain to him what, what, what you do. What was your key takeaway without getting into your you know, without bipolar me down on the mental couch. issues or whatever <laughs> they are, Charlie? No, I, I, I think – like any co- – uh, what a good coach does is get you to recognize things about yourself. Yeah. So it's not advising and saying you should do this. Is ask yourself why you do that. Ah. And for me, it was actually reprising a lot of family and community and neighborhood roles uh-huh. that I had in the tech community. Interesting. And yeah. some of them translate well. Uh-huh. Yeah. Some of them don't. Not as much. Yeah, you got barbecued at one point for dating too many founders or something. I don't remember uh, oh, the exact nature of it, but I know that you... When you're on the internet for 10 plus years, there's yeah. lots of things that people I always thought say. that was kind of unfair. It's like, well, so what if he dated a couple of people in the industry or asked people on dates? I don't... I can't speak for what everybody says about me on right. the internet. So, uh, you know, it's... Uh, but you're not... It's supposed to say dating in the industry, not on the table or the, not a good idea. Not a good idea. Yeah, that's. I mean, I sort of kind of felt that way too. Is like, especially now that you're like so baller and like investing in companies. Like, I don't. I don't feel very baller. But well, I'm about <laughs> I think of the world's something. tiniest fund. And no, I don't think so. But I, you're, you're investing more than most angel investors probably yeah. do. So yeah. you know, even though, so if you compare it to angel investors, yeah, it, it's dramatically larger. If you compare it to VCs, it's dramatically smaller. But I do think, you know. This new generation of folks who are coming up like you and I and whatever, it's like we're all learning how to do this. And it's very much like it's astounding to me that I have a fund or you have a fund. And I'm not saying that because I don't think either you and I are deserved, but it does seem like there's some seismic shift that's occurred where people are like, you know what? Let's give money to other people to try to invest. Like the, you didn't come up through the ranks of like the traditional well, VC thing. Neither die, right? Yeah. I mean, it was like. No, and that's um, that's really key. It's. The fact that uh, – so I think there are only three investors in startups to ever come from Fordham University. Really? Me, you, and – Don uh, Valentine. What? From Sequoia. Don Valentine's a, I had a no, Ram? I didn't Who know knew? this. And He's great. And I found this out. Yeah. And I reached out to him. That's genius. And it was – one of the and Denzel Washington. <laughs> People don't know that Denzel Washington. A, yeah, but it, Ram. it was one of the most stressful conversations I think I've ever had because you're talking to one of the people who literally built He's the a legend. industry yes. I mean, that I've, you're in. I pitched him on Mahalo and Inside. Yeah. Like he back one in the day. one thing he said to me was really funny. He, he said, "Well, what what kind of advantages do you?" Have I said? Well, you know, I have a big network in New York. I've been doing it for a little while, and he, you know, he's, I don't, he's probably well into his seventies now, but. Yeah. And he, and he paused and he said, um, back when we were investing in semiconductors, mm. there were maybe three or four people on the face of the earth who knew as much about semiconductors as we did. Mm. That's an advantage. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that's, I, don't have, <laughs> I don't have those kind that's, of advantages. Yeah, I don't have that's, that advantage. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. I don't know more about megahertz and systems. But and, he made the yeah. time. And, and actually what was interesting was – I think you made the time just because I asked. And yeah. then I realized if you were a VC in the 60s and 70s and people even knew who you were, they were yeah. probably legit. Yeah. They were insiders. Yeah. I mean – There's no blog. You couldn't look him up. No. You'd never I mean, read about basically, him. Basically, they were just people who came out of like DARPA or the military complex or mm-hmm. whatever. They, they, were, they were part of the first group of people who even used computers. So that just the knowledge of computers. It's actually very similar to what happened with the internet. You know, when I met Jerry and Fred when they were doing Acme Ventures, which became Flatiron, I was a consultant for them and um, then started Silicon Eye Reporter. But when I met them, the reason they wanted to hang out with me and you know, was because I knew what the internet was. And there were only 10 people in New York who did. Scott Heiferman, me, uh, Clay Shirky, Seth. Um, Seth Godin. No, Goldstein. Oh, Seth Goldstein. Yeah. You know, Majestic. Uh, no, Seth uh, – yeah, from um, iTraffic. And no, Scott Heifer was at iTraffic. It's all a blur now. But anyway, all <laughs> these like first ad agencies basically mm-hmm. who were doing CD ROMs, they were doing CD ROMs and then they started to do the web. Just the knowledge that the web existed and how it worked and how to get your PPP, TCP IP set up on a Mac, that whole hour long process was differentiated you from everybody. Well, it's like the outliers yeah. thing, right? Like yeah. the fact that you graduated, what, 96? 
No, it was 93. Okay. From so, college. Yeah, from college. Yeah. 88, though, I was I was in Fordham in 1988 on the internet. On BitNet. It wasn't yeah. really called the internet. It was called BitNet. But that... Or OperaNet. Timing, right? Like, had you graduated four years later, four years earlier? Yeah, no. Like, wouldn't have... If it was 10 years later or 10 years earlier, it would not have hit it at the right time. You know, you got to hit it at the right time. Um, Same thing, I think, with me in New York. Yeah. It... Like, when I, I took a pitch from Union Square Ventures, I was funding funds at huh. the General Motors Pension Fund. Huh. So the institutional money behind VC. Right. And I almost didn't even take the meeting. Yeah. Because in 2004, the idea of new, doing a New York-based fund... It was crazy. ...seemed like a stupid idea. Yeah, they had done the first wave and... and it didn't you know, really work out. Yeah, and no, everything imploded. And it was like, okay, let's do this again. I Village and DoubleClick and... But being at yeah. a fund in New York in 2005... That was sort of the beginning of the in New York upward... ascension. Yeah, the first web, the Web 1.0 of New York was spectacular, but there was no revenue to be made, so it became very hard for these companies to become sustainable, with the exception of DoubleClick. Really, mm-hmm. everything else, Razorfish had some revenue, but that sort of evaporated. So it was very hard for those first group of companies. Now it's like, God, Kickstarter is printing money. I mean, not a lot, but they're printing probably tens of millions. And Etsy's got to be printing. They built themselves a building in Greenpoint. I heard about this. They took their it's VC money building. and just got a building. Well, it's mostly their – I mean, they didn't really raise that much, actually. Ah. Um, but uh, – I heard it's amazing. It's, it's amazing really nice. to me what has happened in New York and Brooklyn specifically. Like when I lived in Brooklyn, you just wanted to get out. It was like, how the hell do I get out of Brooklyn? This sucks. I got to get out of here. Now everybody's like – I'll give you an example racing to with, Brooklyn. Uh, Canary has gone from like six to almost 60 people in like the last year. But they work in Brooklyn. And no, no, they're not in Brooklyn. Okay. Adam lives in Jersey, so there's uh, no way I can get him to move Brooklyn. Over to Brooklyn. But there are companies in Brooklyn. Oh yeah, no tons. Like mouth. Almost half of my is portfolio is Brooklyn based. So they just work in Brooklyn. Oh yeah, yeah, they work in Brooklyn. But no commuting to Manhattan. No, no, no. And uh, something like only four of the Canary hires were not from New York. That they had to move. Hmm. And but they said like anecdotally, probably like a third had moved to New York in the last year. Hmm. They moved to New York first because they thought New York's a cool place to live. Right. And then they went looking for like where the best companies are. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's like New York is really – people ask me like, do you have to come here? Can you go to LA? Can you go to New York? And I'm like, definitely here is the easiest because you're just caught up in it all and there's money everywhere and there's talent everywhere and the talent's amazing. But there's more competition for it too. There's more people there doing is. what you do. Yeah. But in New York, you can really make a go of it. In LA, I would say – I'd say L.A. is where New York was in 2004, 2007. So it's really an interesting story. It's very interesting to see where New York will be in 10 years when Kickstarter and Etsy, Foursquare, whatever, if those companies all work out and go public and have a bunch of millionaires and, you know, the trickle-down effect like, you know, Tumblr and et cetera, like – and actually the Vimeo guys, all those guys from College Humor, like they wound up doing 10 more companies, right? And so you'll have funding some of them. And funding a bunch. Jake, Jake yeah. Lodwick is the first angel in MakerBot. Right. So he must have made $50 million when that sold or something crazy. He probably made more from that than, than he might have made at College Humor. College Humor, yeah. Yeah, he probably owned 5 or 10% of that company and sold for a billion, right? So I think the trickiest thing about New York is here, the one and only thing to do is to grow a public company. Yeah. That's – that's, you're either that person or you're not. No mm-hmm. one cares about – a $750 million exit here. Yeah, no, New York, it would be one of the top 10 exits. Yeah, yeah. And, and so from a New York entrepreneur's point of view, somebody comes along and offers you half a billion dollars for your company. Yeah. You're out. Yeah, you're And done. so... Here it's like, oh, I only got offered half a billion. I'll just go on the secondary market, sell 100 million and keep going. Yeah, and as a person with an $8 million fund, I'm, I'm not pushing, but if right. you say, hey, I think I'm out at 500 million, I'm like, I'm okay with that too. Yeah, sure. I invested at four. I'll take my 120x. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But that's why I think one of the, some of the Brooklyn stuff is interesting because it's people who almost like don't even care about money. Right. Like the Kickstarter guys, they don't really care. They want to like impact the way all yeah, creatives. Yeah, Etsy feels like, the same way. Like they want to change the, the world. Way. And like, yeah, MakerBots yeah. along those lines. Vice, yeah. same thing. Right. Vice is amazing too. Wow. Huge. It's like the biggest employer in Williams, Williamsburg. Is it really? Yeah. 
more than the Church of Latter-day Saints or whoever owned all those buildings. <laughs> Who owned all the buildings? Oh, oh the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses owned There's, all of Dumbo, but they've been selling it, right? They've been selling it. They own like a billion dollars of real estate in Brooklyn. I remember when I was a kid, they just had bought all the buildings under Dumbo and they, they looked like upstate. idiots because it was like, who the hell would ever want to be by the Manhattan Bridge exit, you know, or the Brooklyn Bridge exit. It's like, oh my God. And now Etsy is moving into one of those buildings. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, Dumb, pra- Dumbo pra- Heights. They praise Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> They've been away. They, <laughs> I miss Brooklyn. I, I have a, my biggest problem right now with Brooklyn is the Nets, because I'm a diehard Nick fan my whole life, and then they put like the Nets in my backyard and like. And soon to be the Islanders. What? I think, yeah, the Islanders are playing in Brooklyn next season. No. Yes. I went to a preseason That's game. That totally f's with me because I'm Knicks Rangers Giants, so I could never be an Islander fan. But I hate the Islanders. It's Long Island. Yeah. That's why they call them the Islanders. Well, technically, Brooklyn is. Yeah, yeah, and, and we, yeah. It's still all a big island, but yeah, the, the Islanders, Islanders are going to play in the Barclays where? Center. Where? In, in the, the Barclays, Barclays Center? Center? Yes. That's going to be amazing for the NHL. Yeah. Because nobody is going to the games in Long Island. No, it's terrible. <clears throat> what a what a disaster for Long Island losing that team, and a disaster for Jersey losing the Nets. Mm-hmm. Both of those towns are schmucks for letting them go. And you know what they're doing here? These knuckleheads in San Francisco. The they, you know who you team? are. No, they're try- They're like the Warriors want to move from Oakland to San Francisco. So the NBA team that's in Oakland is willing to go here. And the 49ers want it to be up here. And the city is like, yeah, you know what? Football team, no thank you. And we'll say no thank you to the Warriors as well, basketball team. So, like, the Warriors keep moving a little bit further south each time. But, like... And taking a fan base way. And... It's like, are you crazy? I mean, the ba- the Giants over here are have changed the entire city. People walk after work to a game. They leave. They can walk home from a game. It's a great experience going to the games at the Barclay Center. It's an amazing experience yeah. going to Barclay Center. Like, you just... You get out and you're home. Yeah. You can just jump on the R train or whatever you want to do. Decal, boom, you're done. It's incredible. All right, anyway, let's talk for hours about <laughs> this week in Brooklyn. I have this fantasy we're going to move back to Brooklyn when I'm... Uh, Maybe. I'd like to. Oh, my God, I miss Brooklyn. I miss New York. But Manhattan, I, you know, it's like very weird to be in Manhattan for me now. Yeah. It's like... I don't know why anybody moves into Manhattan. It's like, it's not what it used to be. It's like, it's so boring and sterilized. It's like Disney World now. It is like a weird, like, Ep- it feels like Epcot Center in some way. Like, this is New York. There are tall buildings, you know? Yeah. And it's like, where are all the cool people? It's like, yeah, they're over the bridge in Brooklyn. All right, Charlie O'Donnell, everybody can follow him. CEO NYC. He's not a CEO anymore, but he's... It's my initials. Ah, Charles Eric O'Donnell. See, I always thought you were being obnoxious and just being no. like, I'm the CEO in New York City. I am obnoxious in many ways, but, but that, that's that, not one of them. I just thought that was like, I'm the CEO. It's not going to be CEO Jason <laughs> on Twitter. No, it's CEO NYC. Follow him on Twitter. He's very clever when he's not beating up other startups for raising more money. <laughs> uh, Mark's just but I get beat up on for that, and yeah. that's the way we should work. That's it. Listen, I mean, he's got the easiest job in the world. He gets to invest. Uh, it's the easiest job, I can tell you. I have it as well. Mark Suster has it. Anybody who thinks... These VCs are so upset at me when I say that. They're like, don't say that. It's like so hard. I'm like, you just were in Italy big, for six weeks. There's also a big difference. Asking for four weeks. Some people work a lot harder than others. That's the truth, too. There are some VCs who, like, I I guess Roloff Botha from Sequoia comes to mind. Like, he will call me anytime, anywhere. He's just on it, you know, like constantly working and at every meeting. And then I go to some board meetings and it's like, VCs don't show up, or they show up late, or they're not on the call, or they're in the fucking subway on a call. I'm like, who the fuck is calling? I'm sorry. Beep that out. Who the <laughs> fuck is calling from the train for a board meeting? You're they're a VC. Grow the fuck up and get in your office, put a headset on, and read the materials instead of breaking in and out with your stupid opinion. Like, these people work for two months, and then you – you ever have that? People got a call on the phone? On the yeah. It's, board meeting? Th- there's, like, a, there's a wide – Range of holy Jesus. investor this is my, effort. My, I always tell this to entrepreneurs: like, talk to the three or four companies that this person's been on the board of. Oh yeah, do due diligence. Diligence yeah. the shit out of VCs. Don't just take the first person. Do who not. Comes along. Yeah, you have to go call all their previous. That How did they do on the board? Talk to my portfolio companies. Tell for sure. Tell me that you don't get good references from them about. Please, because then you want to jump on, on it yeah. and make sure you correct it, right? Like, mm-hmm. if I had if I had a portfolio company that was not happy with my performance, I'd be on it. Thanks again to WeWork for uh, hosting this week in startups. Thanks to our sponsors. Thanks to Nathan and Flick and Operations. Bryce holding down the fund. Brandon on events. Oh, yes, Jackie. 
Ah, yes, Jake. Emmy Award person, Jack and Jacob. Luke, Drew, Matt, and Julian. Keeping the lights on, making that bank. I'm going to go into that room and yell at my salespeople in a minute. And uh, follow at TWI Startups. And I'm at Jason, of course. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. <laughs>